High above Dartmoor stands a windswept and spectacular country home. It looks ancient, a hefty medieval fortress, but in fact, this towering edifice was only built a hundred years ago. It's the last castle ever constructed in Britain, Castle Drogo. But today, this landmark building is under threat. In their biggest current project, the National Trust is going to restore the castle. They're going to unpiece this structure stone by stone. And in so doing, hopefully, they'll discover more about how it was assembled in the first place. We'll also be looking at the man behind it, the extraordinary architectural genius who not only built this place, but practically reinvented the very notion of the English country house. Sir Edwin Lutchins was that architect. He built glorious houses for the Edwardian super-rich. Houses that drew on our rich architectural traditions and repackaged them for the modern world. How many buildings do you go into where you think, wow, I can really admire this, it's, it's beautiful, and, and feel the spirit also elevated. It's architecture as instant history. But Lutchins didn't just copy from an idealised past, he also built some of the greatest monuments of the British Empire. And after the First World War, he designed the innovative memorials that still define the very way we remember the fallen. Lutchins has been called the greatest British architect since Sir Christopher Wren. Now, the coincidence of the Castle Drogo restoration and the events of the First World War centenary may once again make him a household name. At Castle Drogo in Devon, an £11 million restoration project is getting underway. It's the National Trust's biggest current project, and we've been given exclusive behind-the-scenes access. We'll be following their attempts to save this landmark property from ruin. The story of Castle Drogo begins over a century ago in Edwardian Britain. Upper-class life at this time was a gilded merry-go-round of privilege and plenty, of Downton-esque country houses and weekend-long parties. For newly moneyed entrepreneurs, a grand country house of your own could potentially buy acceptance into this rarefied world. Architecture as social climbing. In the early 1900s, one of the richest entrepreneurs in Britain, Julius Drew, who owned the home and colonial supermarket chain, decided that he wanted to live in the Englishman's ultimate fantasy home, a castle. But he didn't want any old castle. He wanted a new one built for him from scratch. So he approached the supreme English architect, Sir Edwin Lutchins, and this is the jewel that Lutchins created for him, a masterpiece of English architecture. Drogo fits within a long tradition, dating from as far back as Tudor Britain, of building castles purely for status and display. To find genuinely defensive castles, you have to go right back to the Normans. Even so, Drew demanded more than a hint of Norman influence for Drogo. Oh, Brian, these blocks are really chunky. Are they solid? Absolutely. Each one is a handcrafted um, piece of local granite from local quarries um, about six miles away from us here on Dartmoor. And the Normans made their castles out of granite, didn't they? Yes, they, they would have used the, the local stone that was available. And, of course, on Dartmoor, it's granite. And yet, if you look up at the roof, it's really quite light. It, it, it doesn't dominate you, it doesn't squash you with its power, does it? Absolutely, and I think that's something uh, really clever that Lutyens has done. And a lot of the big architecture happens at Drogo in the corridors and on the staircases as you circulate around your grand house. 
self-made millionaire Julius Drew wanted to establish links to his supposedly Norman aristocratic ancestry. He saw his castle as a crucial part of this process, and therefore it was essential that it be as authentically Norman as possible, but without the medieval hardships. So Drogo also incorporates early 20th century technology to make it into a comfortable home. It's got the very latest in plumbing and telephones, and even had its own hydroelectric generators. Below stairs, there's a modern, well-equipped kitchen. In its heyday, over 30 full-time servants were needed to keep this house up and running. With more than 100 rooms laid out over six levels, this is a seriously impressive structure. Yet it's not so austere or grand as to be unwelcoming. Castle Drogo is a castle on a human scale, and Lutchen's at his best is, is, is always when he's at his most humane. And here's Drogo doing all that kind of castly stuff on the outside, saying, you know, impregnable, don't come here, I'm, I'm massive, you know, expressing ideas of fortitude, and actually inside it's a great house. It's also the most fantastic contribution to where it is, and it looks like one of those tours. It looks like, as Lutchen's wanted it to from a distance, a rocky outcrop but made by man. And that has to be the mark of a great building, that it really contributes and makes that place more interesting, better. But Drogo's in trouble. A huge team of craftspeople is descending on the castle, preparing it for an epic five-year project to restore it to glory. Phil Harding's finding out what's threatening the very fabric of this national treasure. So what is the problem? The problem is we've got a lot of water ingress coming in through the roofs, um, so water's actually getting into the building and uh, doing a lot of damage inside. But, I mean, surely, I mean, it can't be the whole building. I mean, it's only got to be one or two little problems, and it, it, it can't be that vast. No, it's the whole building. It's the actual, the whole of Castle Drogo leaks um, from the roof to the windows um, to the walls. So what effect was it actually having on the structure of the building? A devastating effect. What it's actually doing is it's actually corroding the steelwork in the reinforcing of the roof, um, which is actually weakening weaken the main structure. Drogo's built with a steel frame holding its structure together. So it's actually got as much in common with the New York skyscraper as it has with the Tower of London. If these girders were allowed to rust away, the whole castle would eventually collapse. And in ten years' time, the problems we would have would be irreversible. We'd have to actually start taking the concrete structure apart. We'd be actually then into the building, and it would never be feasible to do the work. We'll follow the team as they start to peel back the structure's outer skin and get to grips with the causes of the rot within. Drogo may be suffering, but it's just one of dozens of iconic Lutchin's buildings around the country. Many look as impressive now as when they were first built. So why is this great architect's name all but forgotten today? It's a real puzzle. Is Lutchin simply too locked into an Edwardian past? The age of the British Empire in all its pomp and glory? He was certainly born at the very height of empire in 1867. Queen Victoria was on the throne, and Britain very much ruled the waves. Lutchin spent much of his childhood here, in the pretty Surrey village of Thursley. His family background was solidly upper class. His father had been well-to-do until he decided to become an artist. Anxieties about money would drive Lutchin's throughout the rest of his life. Hi, Jane. Hi, Tony. How come Lutchin spent so much time here when he was young? I thought in those days, middle-class children tended to get bundled off to uh, boarding school. Uh, well, they did. But the <coughs> thing about um, Lutchin's was that um, he was the um, 11th child out of 14. He had 10 brothers, so that's a lot of school fees. His father had run out of money by then. But also, um, he had pretty bad health. Um, he was quite ill as a child, so they kept him at home. Uh, from the, you know, the crucial years, 13 to 15, he was, he was here, he was in Thursley. So what did he do while he was here? Well, he wasn't actually doing much school. He was learning to draw. Uh, and he spent a huge amount of time just um, 
like you on his bicycle, uh, bicycling around the Surrey countryside, um, looking at um, buildings uh, and sketching them. And he used to carry a bit of glass and he had a sharp bit of soap and he would sketch the outline of a building and then um, take it home and draw it up. That's very nice, piece of vernacular arc. Look at that long roof. Yeah, low yeah. roof. Sketching some of Surrey's finest old buildings taught Lutchins the fundamentals of traditional British architecture. But at 15, he signed up for a more formal education at the National Art Training School in London. He dropped out after two years and became an articled pupil in the offices of established architect Ernest George. But Lutchins detested churning out what he saw as lifeless, uninspired designs. Later on in his career, he said he hadn't learned one single thing in that whole time. So after about a year, he left, which for a 19-year-old was a big gamble. In a remarkably bold, some might say arrogant, move, Lutchins set up his own practice. He even won a couple of small commissions. But then in 1889, he made a chance meeting that would prove utterly life-changing. Gertrude Jekyll was the most famous garden designer of the day and an admired painter. She was impressed by the perky young architect and soon became convinced that he was the man to build her a country house in the fashionable arts and crafts style. Led by William Morris, the arts and crafts movement championed the handmade and the traditional over industrial era factory produced goods. I can see how the arts and crafts notion might apply to tapestries and wallpaper, that kind of thing. But how does it apply to architecture? Well, I think what happens with architecture is that there's a sort of rebellion against um, uh, the Victorian city, all these sort of straight brick built houses. And there is a flight from the city to the countryside. And um, architects start building cottages and start looking around them and using local techniques, local craftsmen, local materials. But the driving force behind the arts and crafts movement was William Morris, right? And he was a socialist. His work was a celebration of the skills of the common man. Did Lutchins feel like that? Lutchins certainly did not. But I think he agreed with Morris about the importance of, of craftsmanship. But for him, it, it wasn't about changing people's lives um, and the way they thought. It was an aesthetic thing. Mm. I mean, he, he believed in, you know, his religion was beauty. And Lutchins did everything in his power to build Jekyll the beautiful arts and crafts house that she wanted. This is it, Munstead Wood. Completed in 1896, is seen as his first masterpiece. And I can see why. But it's only when you look at the house from the air that you get a full understanding of the architectural trickery that makes it work. Grand Design's Kevin MacLeod is joining me to explain what makes this house unique. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on, isn't there, which is um, very, very influenced by, by the arts and crafts movement. You get these traditional things like the big eaves and the steep pitched roofs and the tall chimneys, and the chimney stack is built out of a harder stone uh, than the, this, this softer, yellower stone used for the walling here. The, the way that the, the mullion windows are set in rows, the, the fenestration, the way that the, the glazing bars are organised, is very, very historical. Those chimneys look to me really Elizabethan. Yeah, a direct copy, you know, slightly enlarged, absolutely. The Arts and Crafts movement made a sort of porridge of 15th, 16th, 17th century um, architectural styles, and this is it. But it's all fiction. I mean, it's all what Lutchen's wanting to, to deliver instant history, as he, as he put it. Gertrude Jekyll loved the house, and from that day on became Lutchen's champion, promoting him and introducing him to prospective clients. She also worked alongside him, designing the gardens to go with his houses. So a Lutchin's house came as the complete package. His love of craftsmanship led him to carefully design every last detail, door handles, window fittings, and even bespoke furniture. He was fast becoming the hot young architect of the day. And thanks to the social elevation of a good marriage and some priceless publicity, 
he was about to become an Edwardian era superstar. Work is proceeding apace at Castle Drogo, where they're attempting to restore to its former glory the work of great British architect Sir Edwin Lutyens. Supermarket Baron Julius Drew, who commissioned Drogo, was determined that his 20th century house should look like an authentic Norman castle. To this end, he insisted on flat roofs. Lutyens reluctantly agreed to his demands and hoped to keep the house watertight with a layer of what was then a cutting-edge material, asphalt. Trouble is, it leaks. I mean, it looks an incredibly solid roof, and you wonder how the hell it is that any water can get through all of this and still penetrate the building. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really thick layer, and it's one of the problems we have, that people see this huge fortress of a building and say, well, it can't leak, it's, it's too big and strong. But as you can see, at that bottom level, which is now opened up, it's still very wet. I presume it's seeping its way down through these cracks here. And I mean, if it, it, this, this, and into, yeah. Oh God, look at that! That's wet. Yeah. And that is moisture that is that is actually stored up. Oh yeah. I mean, once it rains, I mean, it could take two or three days for the for the the, um, the water to reveal itself inside. It tends to sort of build up and build up until the pressure gets to such a state that it actually pushes it into the building. Um, and of course, with this sort of semi-impermeable uh, surface, it can't evaporate off when the okay. sun comes out. So it's trapped in there for a long, long time. To fix the leaks, the team first need to remove the top layers of stone blocks from Drogo. They'll then strip off the asphalt before laying down a new high-tech waterproof membrane layer. This advanced material will keep water out while still allowing the structure to breathe. With that in place, they'll eventually put the stone blocks back together like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. It's a daunting undertaking, but if all goes to plan, the castle's grand reopening could really raise the profile of Edwin Lutyens. By the late 1890s, Lutyens was already building a base of wealthy and successful clients. Then in 1897, aged 28, he married the aristocratic Lady Emily Lytton. He married for love. But her upper-class world of wealth and country house parties undoubtedly opened up new work opportunities for Lutyens. And soon after, he met somebody else who would further transform his life. He was an early client who became a good and lifelong friend, the proprietor of Country Life magazine, Edward Hudson. Country Life was the hottest media property of its day, an early incarnation of the Lifestyle magazine. It depicted the gilded world of the Edwardian elite. Who was the readership that was engaging with these magazines? The appeal for, of country life, then as now, was not to the landed gentry alone, but to a much wider market, a suburban market, if you like, of people who imagined themselves living in the countryside. I mean, there's no difference, I believe, in the way that this magazine was viewed then, the way that, that modern decorating magazines are viewed now. You look at these things and they are aspirational. It was the old decoration of its time. Do you think it actually got more commissions on the back of these articles? I think it got commissions on the back of these articles, without a doubt. Having tested these ideas out, Hudson liked them, Hudson put them in his, in his magazine. Lutyen thought, great, let's do another one. I mean, let's go and find some more clients. And then Hudson said, yes, fine, do, do that, and I will put them in the magazine. Yeah. So you need, what kind of magical endorsement is that, you know? There's no doubt that Hudson made him famous. Country Life's beautiful photographs made Lutyens into an architectural superstar, a household name. And he found no shortage of customers in turn-of-the-century Britain. A combination of low taxes and cash flowing back from the British Empire ensured a steady stream of self-made clients for Lutyens. This new wealthy class of bankers and industrialists were aspirational. They wanted some of what the upper classes had without the pomp and stuffiness. 
Luchins designed homes for them that seem to have been there forever, growing seamlessly out of their environment. It's something perfectly exemplified in buildings like Sullingstead in Surrey. Completed in 1897, this is one of his most celebrated early works. It's a romantic design, but with robust, sturdy oak timbering, and it's cleverly nestled into the rolling landscape surrounding it. Just a few years later, there's Goddard's in Surrey, completed in 1900. Here, Lutchins makes use of contrasting colours and materials. Rough cast walls against red brick windows and dark roofs tiled in Horsham slate. Throughout his career, Lutchins built over a hundred country houses, many of them regarded as highlights of British architecture. Arguably the most important of all of these designs is Little Thacom, in the heart of the Sussex countryside. At the time of its construction, Lutchins himself referred to it as the best of the bunch. It follows the ground plan of a manor house built around a hall. But while it may at first glance look like an ancient Elizabethan house, it has the simplicity and symmetry of the classical architecture that Lutchins was increasingly influenced by. Inside, over half the floor plan is given over to halls, stairs and corridors. Lutchins loved to create big dramatic spaces inside his houses, even at the cost of everyday living space. Nowhere more so than this. If he died after designing this, do you think he would still be a world-famous architect? I, I don't think that these buildings made him uh, an architect that history would remember. What these buildings did was make him a very, very commercial, successful architect of his time. The extraordinary thing about Lutchens is that he did all this stuff so well, so early, he still had the rest of his career to develop into a really unique architect. Lutchens' arts and crafts houses made his name both in this country and far beyond. But by the early years of the 20th century, he was getting frustrated with just working on small domestic properties, however beautiful they might be. He wanted to up his game and find bigger and bolder projects to occupy his talents. But that meant sniffing out big money. The money trail would lead Lutchins a long way from the sleepy home counties, right to the heart of the British Empire, the Indian Raj. Here in New Delhi, he would finally get the chance to build on a truly immense scale. At Castle Drogo, they're now beginning to lift out the massive granite blocks from the top levels of the structure. The engineers have brought in a 100-tonne crane to hoist down the largest individual pieces from around the massive light wells. Even so, it's a logistical challenge. It's not easy to fit the large blocks through narrow gaps in the scaffolding. So how many blocks do you reckon you've taken out so far? Um, about 35, 40, so... 35 to 40, and how long's that taken you? Just under a week. Just under a week? Yeah. And how many do you reckon you've got to take out? Well, on this phase, um, it's about 1,600. Uh, on the whole building complete, it's about 2,650. So that's going to be well into next year? Oh, well, this, this, this phase will last uh, to 2015. The demands of this process reveal just how daunting the construction of Drogo was in the first place. In fact, the initial plans were so vast that early in the build, owner Julius Drew decided to reduce its scale by a third, losing an entire wing. So for Lutchins, the chance to build on a truly monumental scale would come elsewhere. India. Here 
were in Delhi, the British government in India wanted to build an enormous new capital. It would be a project on an epic scale, and as its centrepiece, there would be a vast new Viceroy's palace. This would be a potent symbol that the British were here to stay. The plan to build an impressive new capital city in Delhi was intended as an unequivocal statement that Britain had no intention of caving in to calls for independence. Lutyens was desperate to be part of the vast construction project and had for many years been travelling to Delhi to help design the new city. He'd found the existing city of old Delhi decayed but littered with the remnants of earlier empires. From the medieval Qatab Minar to the serene low D tombs. And Shah Jahan's massive and imposing red fort, one of the highlights of Mughal civilization. Yeah. Author William Dalrymple has explored Luchin's rather surprising response to Indian architecture. When Luchin's arrived here, what did he think of India? He didn't like India at all. And, I mean, it's funny because we now associate Luchin so much with New Delhi, with India. But if you read his letters, it's a bit of a shock to find out what an incredibly provincial little Englander he is. He, he comes out with a lot of very silly, racist jokes. Anything about India that isn't like Britain, he doesn't like. Somewhere between patronising and outrightly racist is the tone of his letters. What about Indian architecture? He didn't like that either, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. I mean. There are, I think, a cluster of about 15 World Heritage Monuments, UNESCO World Heritage Monuments, in a small area of about 10 or 15 miles here. And one after another, he dismisses them. He doesn't like the medieval stuff. He thinks the mogul stuff is like housemaid's closet. The red fort he dismisses as childish architecture. And if you look at his initial drawings of what he's first trying to build in India, it's just simple classical buildings with pediments, pillars. He could be sitting in Athens or Rome. It's as if he's learned nothing at all. The casual racism is all too apparent in Luchin's letters, something that's typical of colonial attitudes at the time. But despite the prevailing climate of intolerance, Luchin's paymasters were determined that the new Viceroy's palace should contain some Indian influences. It turned into a bureaucratic tussle, with Luchin's for once not keen to incorporate historical traditions. But while he may have been resistant to Indian influence, his wife Emily was rather more open. Over the years that Luchins was building New Delhi, she was increasingly pulled into the orbit of the Theosophy Society. Theosophy draws on elements of Christianity, Hinduism and Buddhism, and holds all religions and all human beings equal. Jiddu Krishnamurti was the movement's Indian figurehead. People throughout the world are seeking comfort but not understanding. And as long as they seek comfort, they will never find spiritual comfort because behind it there is no true understanding of life. And for the understanding... Emily doesn't appear to have had a physical relationship with the young guru, but her letters indicate an unusually strong bond. She traipsed around after Krishnamurti, following him all over the world. She took up the cause of Indian nationalism in direct opposition to her husband's employers, who were the British government in India. And to cap it all, she said that in line with her theosophical beliefs, she was going to become celibate, which can't have made marriage a bed of roses. So Lutyens was under pressure both at home and at work. Perhaps his wife's theosophical egalitarianism came to affect his outlook. Or maybe India eventually worked its magic on him. After touring the country extensively, he seems to have come to appreciate at least some elements of Indian architecture. And he was now convinced that the Viceroy's palace was his chance to make a lasting impact. When it was opened in 1929, the Viceroy's Palace was immediately recognised as one of the most significant buildings in the British Empire. Now it's called the Rastrapati Bhavan, and it's the official residence of the President of India. It's an architectural triumph.
The Rashtrapati Bhavan is far and away the largest of all Luchin's works. Standing in a 330-acre estate, the project consumed one and a half million cubic feet of stone, seven and a half thousand tons of cement, and over 1,300 tons of steel. It's architecture on a truly massive scale. But given Luchin's earlier dismissal of Indian influence, is this palace just an imperial anachronism? How Indian is it? I know that Luchin's initially was a bit sneery about Indian architecture, and you look at some of these early drawings, they don't look very Indian, do they? No, I, I think the architecture was very imperial. He wanted to put a stamp of empire on this new imperial capital in India. And so he did consciously pick elements from England that he superimposed on Delhi. But he was always a member of the arts and crafts movement. And I think he decided that you had this very strong building, but you brought the lyricism and the Indianness into the embellishments of the building. So trellis work, jalis, which the Mughals used a great deal, they allow privacy and a lot of air to move in and out. The courtyards, which is very much a part of Indian building tradition. Narrow windows to keep out the dust and the hot air of, of the northern Indian plains. Overhangs, chajjas, uh, with motifs underneath of the lotus, which is again a very Indian element. And beautiful gardens. They were absolutely lovely and they were based on the Mughal charbagh. So he just was very, very astute in using the strengths of India and blending them into a very imperial looking building. Do you like it or does it get up your nose as a bit of imperial showing off? I think it is one of the most stunning buildings in New Delhi. And I find that the the attention to detail, absolutely staggering. I think it's a gem. It, it, it has Britain and it has a lot of India in it. And the skill of the hands, the, the strengths of India, color, motif, pattern is all there in Rashtrapati Bhavan. <laughs> Viceroy's palace may have been the largest project of Luchin's career, but ironically, the one for which he's probably best remembered is one of his smallest. Luchin's was hitting his creative peak just as the First World War convulsed Europe. It would push him to produce a radically democratic body of work, memorial architecture that couldn't be further removed from Indian palaces and high-end country houses. Edwin Lutyens was 47 years old when World War I broke out, an architect at the height of his powers. The war effort was soon sucking in all of the country's resources, and big construction projects like Castle Drogo quickly started to feel the pinch. What happened to Drogo in World War I? Well, um, obviously, construction was in full swing. Um, in fact, a large proportion of the castle was up to roof level, so there were a substantial amount of men uh, and materials working on site and so on. Did all work stop? Well, not immediately. All of the men who were of enlistable age either had to leave or enlist, so Drew would only employ um, men who couldn't enlist. And they managed to keep going, actually, for quite a substantial length of time. But by 1917, really, they had run out of manpower and materials, and work did actually finally stop. Presumably, Drew was too old to fight. Absolutely. Um, and, um, but he was the, the age where he had to send his sons to war. Um, and he had three sons, Adrian the eldest, Basil the middle boy, and Cedric the youngest. Adrian, tragically, um, was killed at Ypres. He had um, survived the horrors of the Somme, 
but in July 1917, he was shot by a sniper. Julius Drew never really got over this terrible emotional loss. It seemed to sap his interest in Drogo, and on top of that, the financial blows of World War I caused him to reduce his ambitions for the castle even further. The same year that Drew's son died, 1917, Lutchins was appointed one of the first three architects for the War Graves Commission. The commission would decide how to commemorate the dead, and in preparation for this task, Lutchins travelled out to the battlefields to see trench warfare for himself. He wrote this to his wife, Emily. What humanity can endure and suffer is beyond belief. The battlefields, the obliteration of all human endeavour and achievement, and the human achievement of destruction, is bettered by the poppies and wild flowers that are as friendly to an unexploded shell as they are to the leg of a garden seat in Surrey. It's all a sense of wonderment. How can such things be? The experience made him determined to apply all his skill to finding an architectural language that could express the scale of grief felt in Britain. The remains of the fallen were all actually buried in France. So there was a desperate need for memorials here at home that would adequately mark their loss. And Lutchins was the architect who seemed to find the most effective answer, above all with his monument in the heart of London. It's so familiar, the cenotaph, isn't it? It's almost like a piece of national furniture. I've gone past this place so many times over the last half century that I hardly ever noticed that it's here. Today, English heritage is restoring the monument. A century of London street grime is being scrubbed away to ready it for the World War I centenaries. This is the only writing on the whole memorial. Just three spare, well-considered words. The glorious dead. A lot of them seem very different, these drawings, don't they? Architectural historian Gavin Stamp is the foremost authority on this deceptively simple monument. To my eye now, and I suspect to yours as well, one of the most attractive things about it is that it, it's so spare. It's, it's very understated, isn't it? Oh, yes, it's a wonderful, simple elegance. But in fact, although it seems so simple, this pylon with a coffin on the top, it's full of the most elaborate subtleties. I think people don't realise at first, though it's obvious when you look at it, the verticals aren't verticals, but they're curves. This may be quite a boorish question, but if it's supposed to look straight and lean and spare, why do you bother with having bowed bits? Well, they make it look right. That's the nature of um, the optical correction. It's the principle of, of, that the Greeks used of entarsis, of these optical corrections you have on the Parthenon and other Greek temples. If you have, say, a Greek Doric column with straight sides, it looks pinched in the middle, mm. which is why they all swell slightly. And Lutyens understood that, and so he applied this, you know, these mathematics to this design. But it was just meant to be a temporary structure. So if it was temporary, what was it going to be made of? It was made, the first one was made of wood and plaster. Oh, there was one there before the stone one? Oh, yes. And originally intended to come down the moment the, 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 the procession was over. You say temporary, how did it become permanent? With the peace celebrations, at the end of that day, it was piled up with wreaths and flowers. It seemed perfectly to express the grief of a nation. All those wives, mothers, fiancés, sisters who'd lost somebody needed some sort of focus for their mourning, and the cenotaph provided that. So it was people power rather than politicians that turned the memorial into a permanent fixture on Whitehall. One thing that strikes me really obviously about it is the, the lack of religious iconography. I would have expected in, in the early 1920s to see lots of crosses hanging off it. Yes, indeed, but Lutyens were very much against that, um, as, of course, was Fabian Ware, the creator of the Imperial War Graves Commission. Um, they well knew that it wasn't just Christians who'd been fed into the slaughter, but Jews and Muslims and Hindus and, and others and people of no religion. 
And Lutyens very much wanted this memorial to be all-embracing, not to have any particular partisan religious symbolism of that but sort. This is the home of the Church of England. There's all those bishops in the House of Lords. Did they not react to this? There was a lot of opposition from the bishops and the, sort of the mass ranks of, of headmasters and all those sort of people. And many, of course, devout Christians felt very upset by the absence of Christian symbolism. But, but Lutyens certainly felt it should be all-embracing. And on the whole, the nation seemed to have agreed. So effective was Lutyen's architecture of mourning that it's still today the focus for Remembrance Day ceremonies. It's early on Remembrance Day morning, the cenotaph looking as clean and fresh as it did when it was first erected. Already there's a, a real sense of quiet and hush and somberness around here. Although it's so early, crowds have started together very silent, waiting for the commemoration to begin. And it really does feel as though 100 years after its construction, the cenotaph still has got an enormous power to, to move us. It's a focus for national mourning for those who died in war. The cenotaph still stands in the heart of London as the perfect symbol for the fallen of World War I. But Lutyens was also instrumental in designing the war cemeteries. The War Graves Commission's decision to bury the dead close to where they'd been killed had run into some high-level opposition. Yet they stuck to their ruling that repatriation wouldn't be allowed for any fallen soldier, however grand or powerful their family. The men who'd fought together would be buried together in hundreds of cemeteries to be erected on the sites of the former battlefields. Rudyard Kipling called them the silent cities. Lutyens was their key architect insisting on simple and uniform headstones, the same size for all ranks. This was a democratic first. In the past, the graves of most private soldiers had gone unmarked. But not every soldier's family even had the small solace of a grave. These fields were literally drenched in blood. In this little area, approximately seven miles square, the combined armies suffered more than a million casualties. It's the Somme, where after the battle, the remains of 73,000 British and Commonwealth troops were never found. And it was once again Lutyens who somehow found the architectural language to commemorate these missing men. His memorial arch stands at Tibval, a small village in the heart of the Somme. This building is specifically designed to remember the soldiers who went missing, isn't it? Yes, it was designed in such a way that the 73,367 men who were originally missing could be recorded. And originally, the numbers were more than 73,000, but as they identified the bodies over the time, they erased the, the names. It is an extraordinary piece of architecture. One could use the word unique. It's unusual as a memorial in that it's not just a chunk in the middle of a square or an a, arch, sort of an arch yeah. for example. It looks simple, but in fact it's a very complex structure with these interlocking arches and creating these corridors around which visitors can walk and be moved by all these names. Tietval is nearly 500 feet above sea level. It dominates the whole area. It's the largest memorial in the world. We have more than 200,000 people a year come here, and they're astonished and moved by this monument.
The war graves and monuments made Luchins a national figure, and he was knighted shortly after the war. With the World War I centenaries now turning a spotlight on these monuments, Luchin's name may well be once again in the ascendant. By the time he died in 1944, he'd been responsible for over 400 buildings, including some of the most stunning houses ever built in Britain. And when the Castle Drogo restoration is completed in 2017, it will be unveiled anew as one of his greatest works. Although perhaps New Delhi remains the most spectacular of all his achievements. There aren't many architects who get the opportunity to build a whole new city, are there? Complete with broad streets and magnificent buildings and great planting. I sometimes think if we dug up New Delhi and teleported it over to Hyde Park, placed it down there, people would go, oh, well, yes, we do have another architect as good as Christopher Wren, but it's not going to happen, is it? But with the massive renovations at Castle Drogo, one of his finest buildings will still be with us for centuries to come. The beliefs and practices of our ancient ancestors, Britain's Bronze Age mummies, the Time Team special next Sunday at 8, a preview coming up. Next tonight, shocking antics coming up in the hit comedy, Bridesmaids. If you miss Tony Robinson walking through history, catch up now on 4OD. Tony Robinson investigates Britain's ancient burial grounds. Life and death, they weren't distinct and separate like they are today. With unexpected discoveries. It had seemed like a crazy idea that there could possibly be mummification in prehistoric Britain. Britain's Bronze Age Mummies, a Time Team special, next Sunday at 8 on 4.